Well, good morning. It's good to see you all here today. I thought Brad Pitt or something came in. Everybody was crowded over there. So. Must just be Janine. Well, welcome back. We are in the book of Genesis, which judging it took a year for the book of Luke, we should be here somewhere until the millennium. Yeah. And you know, I so really want to go through it quickly, but then there's so much. And the basis of much of what we believe comes from Genesis. You have the beginning of all things, and of course, a, a parallel book to the book of Genesis is actually the book of Revelation. It's rather interesting when you look at them side by side. It's, it's rather interesting, God's initial creation and his recreation and how very similar they're going to be. Uh, so we're going to take a look at Genesis chapter 1. We're going to finish today. It's only five verses. I figured that's not too ambitious. But we're going to look at the pinnacle of God's creative work which is you, which sounds a little hard to say that you are God's pinnacle of his work. You're his best work. Yeah, I know that makes me kind of swallow hard. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we can look into your word that has been preserved for us and written down so that we might know you, that we might know ourselves. Lord, we find that in knowing you, we know ourselves better because we're made in your image. I pray that you help us, Lord, as we open your word, that you might open up our minds and our hearts, that we might understand what it is that you have for us, that you might work through my frailties and failures, and that you might speak to every heart here by your Holy Spirit, that you would accomplish what you have set forth to do through your word. Help us to have a greater understanding of our place and our purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been going through the book of Genesis. Just to go over some things we've been discussing, we went through the six days of creation, stopping short at the creation of man, uh, which again is the pinnacle of uh, God's creation. And we saw the order and all of the events and how things happened and I didn't get into a lot of the prehistory of things. I didn't get into dinosaurs and where they fall in. I didn't talk about too much about evolution uh, or, or uh, the spectrum of light and how far away stars are and the speed of light and how you can change time and how two people can be twins and one person can go far away and come back and be younger than the other one when they get back. And all of the scientific theory, all of the scientific theory about you know Einstein's relativity and, and all of that. We didn't talk about that. I don't, I'm sorry. So I, I, I got into molecular biology way over my head talking about things that I should probably leave alone. So we talked about the six days of creation. We saw this parallelism that exists on the first day. There was light and God separated light and darkness. And we saw that on the fourth day, he created the sun, moon, and stars to govern that area. We saw on the second day there was a firmament, meaning sky. He separated the waters from the waters. We saw on day, four, on day five, he created birds for the firmament above and fish for the oceans beneath. And then on the sixth day, we see the first, the third day, he lets dry land appear and vegetation to happen, and then he inhabits that. So we see God's creating or forming and then his filling with those things. And I, uh, I have to tell you, I didn't see that before. So uh, I'm glad I'm studying through it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We talked about how if you can understand that passage, everything else is going to be much easier for you. It's because people don't believe that first line. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything that we see, everything that's seen and everything that's unseen has been created as opposed to having billions of years to happen by accident, which nothing happens by accident, right? And we know nothing comes from nothing. Everything comes from something. So uh, I know, it's, I'm sorry, I'm getting tangled with my words. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of 
God was hovering over the face of the waters like, like a, a mother hen would hover over her eggs. It's, it's an interesting idiom. It's a Hebrew figure of speech and how the spirit of God is now involved. So we hear God created everything. Now we hear about the spirit of God, one and the same and yet separate over creation. Of course, we know from the scriptures that Jesus was also uh, Colossians chapter one, the creator of all things. All things were created by him and for him. And there's nothing that was created that was not created by him. And so we see the Trinity at work with all three parts involved in creation. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And he called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And so there was evening and morning the first day. It's a, it's a rather interesting story because it's really our story, isn't it? There was a time in which there was darkness on each one of us. There was a time in which God pronounced light and it came to each one of us. And that's our story, isn't it? So it's interesting how your personal life and discovering who Christ is as your Savior and Lord and delivering you from the power of sin also mimics all of creation. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let them divide the waters from the waters. A little confusing, but there was a bit more than the cloud cover that you see now. Uh, at least that's what scholars agree to, that there was more of an SPF going on around the earth, uh, kind of a, a protective layer that was around, which may be why there were so many older people way back when than there are now. Uh, our lives are somewhat cut short, I believe, because of that. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament and the waters that were above the firmament. And it was so, and God called the firmament heaven. And you might call it sky, atmosphere, but also the heavens. So the evening and morning were a second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let dry land appear. So the land was already there. He just had to separate the seas. How do you do that? How do you get rid of water so that land appears? Polar ice caps are a pretty good way. You know, you can freeze it up and... That's why everybody's worried about the polar ice caps going away. Anyway, sorry. You didn't want a scientific conversation in the middle of my intro. And then God said, let the earth bring forth grass. The herb that yields seed and the fruit tree and that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself and the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb that yields seed according to its kind, the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. And so there was evening and morning a third day. And so God parts the seas and lets the land appear, and suddenly vegetation begins to grow. It's a very logical step, isn't it? Because what are the animals going to eat if they don't have any vegetation on the land? You've got to have that. And before that, you have to have light. And so God's doing all of these things in a good order. And then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. By the way, that's what they're for. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. That's what the sun, moon, and stars are for, by the way. Calendar, so that it matches your watch. tough crowd here today and let them be for signs and seasons and days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and it was so and God made two great lights the greater light was to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night he made the stars also and God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light to the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good there was evening and morning, a fourth day. We talked about uh, literal 24-hour days and a young earth uh, understanding and how billions of years are only necessary when things happen by chance and there's no such thing as things happening by chance. Uh, and if you do your laundry and then find that somehow after a week the basket's full again, Everything goes from order to disorder. Everything goes from organized and complex to simple and degraded. That's just the nature. It's the thermodynamics. It's entropy. You guys don't care. Okay. <laughs> God made two great lights. One actually is a light giver, which is the sun, and the other is a reflector, which is the moon. And I mentioned that we're much like the moon. We don't have any light in and of ourselves, but we have that which is shined upon us through Christ. 
unless the world gets in the way, and then there's a giant eclipse. And then there's not much to shine. And God said, let the waters abound with abundance of living creatures. Let them fly above the earth, across the face of the firmament of the heavens. And God created the sea creatures, every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded, according to their kind. You notice this constantly, according to their kind, according to their kind, according to their kind. These are very set families, phylums, species. They're not intermingled. They didn't come from a single amoeba. These are very set things that God has created. And the interesting thing is when you analyze the DNA, there is no ancestral connection. So when you look at each individual of those animals, there is no overlap. And you say, wow, it looks like this came from this because there's all of this information which must have been left over that came from the ancestors. There's none of that. It's a clean book that's on a completely different subject, essentially. So when it says according to its kind, that's what he means. And that's how it works out when we look at under the microscope. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And so there was evening and morning, a fifth day. And so God now fills the sky and the waters that he previously created. And then day six, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. You might see that there's a familiar rhythm to every single one of these days. God said, it was so. It was good. Right? Because it's going to change. This week, we're going to talk about day six, when God creates male and female, and he creates human beings. We'll just read through it. Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you, it shall be food. Also, to every beast on the earth, to every kind, of, every kind of bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And indeed, it was very good. And so the evening and the morning were a sixth day. Did you notice the very good? This is good. This is good. This is very good. Just thought I'd let you know that. So let's begin verse 26. And then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. By the way, who's he talking to? There no people are created yet. Who is he having this wonderful little association with. Let us make them in our image. It's rather interesting. Makes you go. Hmm. But first, you notice there's a difference here. It's not, and God said, and there was, and it was so, and it was good. You notice the rhythm's now been broken. God now is making creatures in his image. He's no longer just creating stuff. He's reproducing. Any of you get married and do that? Three of you, okay. I'm glad. <laughs> it's one thing to have a job and make a product or perform a service, and it's another thing to have children, right? God is changing here. He's going to make creatures 
that are still attached to the earth. In fact, he uses earth to make them, to make mankind. And they're going to be like him in some way, shape, or form. I think that's important. This language is personal. And God now has to, he doesn't say, and according to its kind. He doesn't, he doesn't even go there. It's going to be according to him. You see, when we pass on the image of God to another human being, to a child, we pass on the image of God. That's why adultery is such a tragic thing. That's why it's such a de decimating thing, because we malign the image of God. And we turn some sacred thing that God created into some cheap thrill. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I, warning, I tend to preach occasionally. God is here reproducing. And he is creating creatures with his image. Isn't that interesting? In his likeness. There are three times that we read that God created mankind, by the way, in Genesis 1.27 and 2.7 and in 2.22. I find it rather amazing that there are three mentions of it. Whenever I see threes, I go, that's right. <laughs> the word here is Elohim for God. This is the word for God. Now, when we get into chapter 2, there's an added name for God, and it changes. Instead of just God, it's Lord God. Because it's interesting. You get into Yehovah, or Yahweh, or however it is you want to pronounce it, and that gets tagged on to Elohim. But Elohim is plural. That's why it says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and let them rule. It's rather interesting because in the Hebrew grammar, the, the, the pronoun needs to always match the verb, but it doesn't here. God was considered singular, and we understand that from the scriptures, and yet he's saying, let us make man in our image. There's all sorts of intonations of the Trinity here in which aren't spelled out exactly, but we certainly see it's being spotlighted here. Let us make man in our image. So God is a singular plurality. That's what they teach you when you go to school, big things like that. In Genesis 3.22, it says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And you know what he does. And we'll, when we get there, we'll see it. He stations cherubim so that there's no way that they're going to be able to go back. Or is there another reason? And we'll look at that. But see, it can't be angels because they don't, they're not like God, and this obviously is God doing the creative work. So it is the Trinity. And in Genesis 11:7, 7, it's mentioned again, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. It's interesting. God says, let us go down and confuse their speech. There was no personal appointment from an angel that showed up. This was God himself that went because people got too organized against him, and he decided to frustrate what they were doing. When we get there someday, by the way, you know what that is? God said, let us. Yeah, I know, I know. But if you'll notice at the end of this section, he says, I have provided every green thing for food, and so let us. I'm I know. Everyone grown at once. Get it out. Just, uh, okay, thank you. Make my job easy. And verse 26, and then God said, let us make man in our image. What is it to be made in God's image and in his likeness? Actually, the word image is shadow. So, if you were standing and the light were behind you, you'd be able to look down and see your shadow, the outline of who you are. That certainly isn't who you are, right? But it's a pretty good outline. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. And also in his similitude, which is his likeness. In other words, you'll be like God in some ways. 
obviously a shadow is no substitute for a human being. And there are characteristics in which we have in which God possesses. Isn't it interesting that he doesn't spell all that out? He just lets us wrangle about it and arm wrestle later. I, I want to propose to you three things. Number one, we have a body. We have a body where we can see and hear and smell and taste and walk and talk. And if you notice, God does all these same things. He says that there was a sacrifice that was, and he smelled the scent and it pleased him. We see that God speaks. We see that God walks in the garden in chapter three. We're going to see that he walks through the garden in the cool of the day. We're going to see all of these characteristics about who God is. And I think that's partially what it is to be made in the image of God. We have a corporeal body. God does not, except for one who is Jesus Christ. We have a body. We have a soul, which is, I, I think, threefold as well. We have this mind where we can think, we can rationalize, we can think things out, right? Which you, you, don't, see, you don't see your dog saying, hmm, how do I know I exist? You, you don't find him studying philosophy, un unless it's on TV in some contrived cartoon. But you don't find animals rationally thinking. You see deer by the highway all the time, they can't be thinking. We have emotions and feeling in a way that animals don't have. Have you ever seen an animal laugh? You may see your dog go, <laughs> but he's opening his mouth to the maximum to get air. It's not, he's not pleased with you. It's an amazing thing. You don't find love in the animal kingdom. You find affection. And it doesn't matter what, whose leg it is sometimes. You find affection, but you will not find emotions like you have, like I have, like love, loyalty, all sorts of emotions. Human beings are unique in that respect. We have a mind, we have emotions, and we have a will. It's a, it's a rather interesting thing. That's part of what it is to be made in the image of God, is to have a will. We also have imagination, don't we? We can imagine things, which is a very dangerous place because you can use that tool for good or for evil. So I think there are some of these things in which God possesses in which he hands down to us as human beings. And we have a spirit. So we have a body, a soul, and a spirit, which is that faculty in which we have fellowship with God. There is a morality that we have until, of course, we squelch it out or burn it out uh, or just completely um, negate that part of our lives and trample it like so much grass that's been trampled and then there is none. There's a spirit and there's a leftover. Even before coming to know Jesus Christ, there is some semblance of a spirit. There's a connection because we understand right and wrong. We just do. And I, I can recognize it in everyone else, but it's okay for me. That's usually the depth of which people go with their spirituality. But it's also that mechanism which God has put inside of me that I can have fellowship with him, that I can pray, that I can speak to him, and that he speaks back. Not through my ear, but through my spirit. That's what makes human beings, I believe, made in the image of God. And there are many other things, and you guys can argue about that later. But I think those are three things that I can think of. Being made in the image of God carries both a privilege and a responsibility, and it can only be fu fully realized in Christ. Because as you know, when we get to chapter three, we're going to see we went off road. Adam and Eve, our predecessors, decided they were going to be rebellious against God, and something changed in them at the molecular level, and they hand that down to us. Scripture says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all born broken sinners. And as much as you love those little kids and how sweet and lovely they are, they're little sinners. <laughs> they just are. There's a great privilege and responsibility to be made in the image of God, and this world wants to take that away from you. This world wants you to think that you're just an amoeba, a highly developed amoeba. Because if that's the case, 
I can do anything I want to you because it doesn't matter. I can abort you in the womb. I can murder you if you offend me. I can do a thousand and one things if you aren't created by God. If you're not made in his image, sky's the limit, right? But we are made in his image, and that gives us a great responsibility. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are his workmanship. Uh, the, the word is poema. It actually means poem. We're his poem. We're not just his lump of clay. We're, we're his poem. That's the way he looks at it. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Did you know that you are God's workmanship? Broken, faulty, frail, in need of all sorts of things, but God has that covered. We just have to come to him. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who's in heaven. Um, don't let them see your good works so they think you're a good guy and they like you and they pat you on the back and they uh, extol you to their friends. That's not what it says. That you might give glory to God. It doesn't say show off for them, but when they see those things, we, we have an obligation to give glory to God because we're made in his image, right? How do you like it when somebody else takes credit for something you do? <laughs> you like this thing that I did? You didn't do that. I did that. Don't you want to do that? But in wisdom, you don't say anything. Right. <laughs> Let your light so shine. By the way, that's our obligation. Uh, it, because we're made in the image of God, and he's created us to be the light of the world, by the way. But we're more like the moon that reflects it. And what God is doing here on the sixth day is creating a king over his kingdom. Remember the parallelism? He's creating someone who's going to take care of everything that's been created all six days. Every kingdom needs a king, don't you think? Or else they call it a democracy. And it's interesting here, he says that they have dominion. Make them in our likeness and let them have dominion over what? Over everything. By the way, this word means to rule, to have dominion, to dominate, to tread down, to rule, to subjugate, and to trample. Did you know that that was your job? That's your God-given job. Everyone's shy. God says, I want you to take charge, not just be in charge. I want you to take charge, make things happen, right? Because there are three types of people. There's people that watch things happen. There's people that make things happen. And there are people who say, what happened? <laughs> God says, I'm putting you here to make things happen. That's a high responsibility, isn't it? So he's putting us in charge of all of this. How are we doing? How's the air quality today? Can you drink out of a nearby stream? Would you eat anything that you fished out of the bay? <laughs> Just saying. Psalm 8, David waxes eloquent about being made in the image of God. And he says to the chief musician on the instrument of Gath. It's interesting that David, a guy who killed the giant from Gath, is playing an instrument from Gath. I just find that, I'm sorry. On the instrument of Gath, a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who has set your glory above the heavens. Out of your mouth, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and avenger. Are any of you confused? No, I'm, I'm glad. I was going to explain it. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? By the way, that's mankind. It's not just, not male. And the son of man that you visit him. For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you've crowned him with glory and honor. 
You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. That's how David gushes when he considers God's work and how he's made in his image and put in charge of everything. And he was king. I think I take it for granted. I don't think I appreciate it nearly like I should. I have been created in the image of God and I have a responsibility and a privilege to be that here because that's why he put us here. And this is before the fall. Take control, rule it, make it do something. I like those words. And we see there are now kings over the kingdoms. Over the day, you have the sun, the moon, and the stars. Over the firmament, which is the sky and the, and the water, you have birds and fish. And on the land, you have man who's ultimately going to be the overseer, the CEO of all that happens here, in which we are. You don't see any struggle with any other animal, animal trying to take control and set up a political system, and we're it. Every kingdom needs a king. Is there something else that you should get a handle on and do better? I, I have this sort of thing that I try to do, like what can I do better? Because I don't ever want to get stagnant and be, you know, that's ah, good enough, good enough. I put in my eight hours, I'm done. You know, my wife tells me, hey, could you do some things around the house? I'll do one. I'll just do one, pick one, because I'm not going to do more than one. I'm just going to do one, that's all. When I go in the shower, I, you know, it, it's too much for me to go and grab for soap, so I just rinse, you know. And I, no, 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 that's not enough, you know. Do I have any clothes to wear? I'll just wear the stuff I wore, you know, for the last week. Yeah, you know, it's like, come on. We have a job to be responsible, and I don't think we take it serious. At least I don't. I need to be better. What it is to be in a shadow and similitude of God is a big thing. I just want you to remind you that authority is never taken, but it's always given. Authority is not something we should ever take. It's something that's either granted or you don't have it at all, whether you imagine it or not. You ever go to, go to your job and there's always one person that thinks it's their job watch over everyone and tell them what to do. And they're like equal or even lower on the pay scale than you, but it's their job. Or perhaps you came from a family where you had one person who was the tattletale. <laughs> you know, the reporter. <laughs> if you have a big enough family, there's one that floats to the top of the gene pool and they become that person. Authority is never taken. It's always given. And God is the one who's given authority. Should you be shy about taking something that God gave to you? Not at all. You should lay hold of it with both hands, right? Jesus says this in Luke 22, which we had just finished not long ago. Now there was also a dispute among them, meaning the disciples, as to which one of them should be considered the greatest. Great, Jesus picked a great crowd, arguing about who's the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. In other words, they get something out of it. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel." See, Jesus said, you guys are competing with each other, trying to pretend you're the greatest. 
authority is never taken, it's given. They had it all wrong. And he said, you've, you've got people around you who are in control of things and you see how they run things. They call themselves benefactors. It shouldn't be so with you guys, it should be the opposite. In fact, any of you who thinks you're the greatest, and I can see them going, ooh, ooh, should be the servant of all. Oh, here, take him. <laughs> because when it comes to all the glory and all the pats in the back, human beings in their sinful nature want to run to the front of the line. When it comes to doing the work that's really involved, people don't stand up so quickly. So Jesus reminded them that he the king of kings was there with them and he even stooped down and washed their feet. And he said, if I, your Lord and master, wash your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. So we have an obligation to bear authority in the way Jesus tells us to bear authority, which is as a servant. Amen? Amen. I'll try to remember that. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. <coughs> it's not a secret code. It's poetry. It's prose. Just so that you know, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. It sounds nice. It rolls off the tongue nice, doesn't it? So what in the world does this mean? Other than being a fancy way of saying it. God created male and female. There is the image of God seen most clearly in male and female. There is a school of thought among chauvinists that God created man only in his image. And the woman was just kind of there for a slave. I knew I'd get a woman to react. The image of God, he created them. There is something about male and female together that are the clearest picture of what it is to be made in the image of God. Isn't that interesting that our corporeal, non-corporeal God, who is in a singularity as a trinity, selects a family to be the best witness of what it is to be made in the image of God. I think that's important. Number two, our self-image is based on God's creation. The way I see myself should be, I see myself by the way God sees me. I don't want to see myself by the way that, you know, um, Newsweek sees me. I don't want to see myself the way CBS sees me or anybody else. I need to see myself rooted in God's creation and I'm made in his image, which makes human life sacred, doesn't it? All human life. My self-image should be based in God's creation, not in how I feel. How you feel today? I don't know, I'm feeling depressed. Okay, well, is that true? Well, maybe. Well, did Jesus die for you? Well, yeah. And all are your sins forgiven? Well, yeah. And do you have the power over sin? Are you taking charge? I mean, are you trampling this stuff? Are you taking dominion? Are you doing what Jesus said to do? Well, no, not really. Oh, there's your problem. Our self-image, the way we see ourselves, should be rooted in God's creation. Not rooted in how you feel or how many degrees you have or how much money you have in the bank or whether people like you. Our self-image is based upon what God says not what people say. Amen? Because yeah. if that was the case, we would all be depressed. <laughs> Number three, our sexuality is a gift from him. Oh yeah, I said it. I did. Sex. <laughs> our sexuality is a gift from him because he created them male and female. Notice, no non-binaries. It says in the scripture, he created them male and female. Who created them? God created them. What happens when you reject something God did for you? 
How do you think God feels? Hey, I got this beautiful gift for you. Nah, I want to go for the other team. Our self-image and the way that we see ourselves, including our sexuality, needs to be understood that it is a gift from God. Not something to be despised and forsaken or changed. That's right, Rocco. I said it. <laughs> Number four, in disconnecting ourselves from this foundation, we enter into a life of pure self-determinism. In other words, we cut off from God. And we invite gender dysphoria and a life is no longer sacred even in the womb. Do you understand? Disconnecting ourselves from being created in the image of God has all of these implications. Suddenly, a child in the womb, that's not a child. That's not a person. That's just a, a collection of cells. This, this person who, uh, you know, is of a particular color or a certain race, you can degrade them and look down on them. People that are too old, snuff them, man. We don't need them. They're not good citizens. Listen, you can only do that when you disconnect human beings from being made in the image of God. Can you murder somebody if they're just a highly formed amoeba? Of course you can. I step on bugs all the day long <laughs> without even knowing it. And I don't feel bad. That's what happens when you take the creation of human beings being made in the image of God away. People aren't people anymore. There's no sacredness to human beings, not human life, not children. Not women, not men, not anybody. But because it is rooted in the image of God, every human life is sacred. Christian, non-Christian, I don't care. Life is sacred. Amen? Amen? Which should have something to do with the way that I treat you. Sorry, I told you I tend to preach. Verse 5, or number 5. Only without this understanding can we prejudice, be sexist, be ageist, murderers, suicidal. Do you realize suicide is ending the life that God created? It's murder, it's self-murder. You can only do that when you detach that you're a creation of God. You can only do that when you separate from that. So do you see how pervasive this whole naturalistic mentality is? Well, we came billions of years from little, you think that's innocent and silly and you laugh at it and you snicker. But what it does is it disconnects us from God. And therefore, no spirituality, no morality, it's up for grabs, let's just vote on it. James chapter three, verses eight to 10. He's woeing the fact that the tongue cannot be tamed. And he says, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. James, looking at the fact that he shoots his mouth off, says, man, we can tame animals of all kinds, but just this tongue just is unruly, just will not submit. How many of you feel that way? I just say the wrong thing all the time. Every Sunday morning when I get up here. <laughs> and yet he, he makes an observation. We can praise God and we go through worship and, and, and it sounds so wonderful, but if you can turn and you can degrade another person who's made in his image, who have all the characteristics of the God you just worshiped, how could you do that? First John 4 verses 20 to 21 says, if someone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has seen? Because people are made in his image. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. But as, as my brother Carl likes to tell me, that's a command. <laughs> Carl lays into me with his tall self, he does. <laughs> this is a command. I'll show it to you. It's in 1 John. 
But you see, if you say that you love God and you hate your brother who's made in the image of God, then you're a liar. Because if you love God, then you'll love your brother or your sister because they're made in his image. That's how important it is that we're connected and we understand that we're made in the image of God. And then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. There's that word again. I don't like that word, subdue. That's like being arrested and cuffed and thrown in a car. <laughs> subdue it. Have dominion. There's that word. Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So who's responsible to take care of all these things? You, me, us. It's our job. And by the way, this was ordained before the fall, notice. It's our job before anything got messed up. And by the way, work was also ordained before the fall, which we'll get to. So he says, fill the earth. How you guys doing? You doing, you doing okay? You being fruitful and multiplying? That's some pretty uncomfortable stuff to be said at a wedding ceremony. <laughs> but I'll go there. <laughs> be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, which means bring it into subjection. Make sure you bring it under rule. And have dominion. It means you're the king, you're in charge. Take charge of this thing. Rule, have dominion, dominate, tread down, rule, subjugate, trample, trample. It's actually the, the, the root is what you do to grapes. When you take them and you, you pull them off and you throw them and you trample them and you make them into juice, do that. Make things happen. So what implications does that have for you and I if this is what God said to the first human beings? What implications does it have to evangelism? Matthew chapter 28. All power and authority has been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples. That's what Jesus said. Whose job is that? Raise your hand if it's your job. It's all our jobs, not just the 12, because we'd be in deep trouble, because they're all gone. To work. If God's created me in his image and he's told me to subjugate, he's told me to take charge, he's told me to make things happen, how does that roll out with the way that I perform my job at my work? It makes me a good worker. Amen. It makes me a person who comes in early, leaves late, and isn't a problem to bend and weave and do whatever has to be done to get the job done. You make it happen. Why? Because I've been made in the image of God and this is what he told me to do. I take it seriously. So should you, right? Eh, just do the bare minimum. That's what everybody does. Just don't, don't, don't mess up the curve, man. You know, don't, just calm down. Don't do so much work. Yeah, well, why don't you pick up the pace, bro? Why don't you grab the other end of that thing? Come on. Subjugate. Anyway. Citizenship. What kind of a citizen am I? Oh, well, we're not of this world, so we're just aliens and strangers, so we're not supposed to be part of this world. Well, if I'm supposed to be in control of this place, what does that have to do with my citizenry? Do you happen to know some of the laws that are passing? I mean, other than the obvious Roe v. Wade has been overturned. Do you know what's going on right now in the background, and they're, they're making laws so that nothing really changes, even though Roe v. Wade is gone? Are you aware that there are things going on? Are you letting your influence be known? Are you subjugating these things? You should. These are the implications I think it has on our citizenry. And to ecology. Well, you know, I hear that they just take all that plastic and put it in the dump anyway. Why would I just throw it away? I drank half a bottle of water. I'll just leave it here at church. Guilty laughter broke out that day. <laughs> we got a big giant bottle in the other room. You can fill up your nice stainless steel container or your glass container, and you will save the environment from one more plastic bottle. It means I don't leave the water running haphazardly. It means I don't open the fridge and go, what do we got here? 
grab a seat. That kills me. I count to three, and then I say, kids, close the door, 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 close the door. Okay, got a mental picture of what's in there, right? What do you want? I don't know. <laughs> they've, got, they've got fridges that have a video screen, and all you have to do is boop, and it takes a, a video picture, and you go, oh, but that's burning electricity, too. I'm sorry. I, I get crazy. It's only because I have to pay the bill. Once they grow up and they have to pay the bills, I'm sure it will be a thing for them. Shut that light off, you know. <laughs> have you turned into your parents yet? I'm sorry. What does, it be, what does it mean? If I'm supposed to take charge of everything and I'm the overseer of all these things, in evangelism, I'd better, I'd better be doing what Jesus said. For my work, I'd better be a great employee because I am projecting the image of God to the world. In my citizenship, God has told me to take care of all this stuff. I take it personal. So should you. Ecology. Am I wasting energy? Am I wasting what God has put here? And the semblance of all the perfection that he's left here in spite of the sin. We have responsibilities here because we're made in his image. And we've been called by him to do these things. Colossians 3, verses 1 to 17. I think I'm going to close with this. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things in the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death the members which are on this earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, by the way. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you, you, you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and you put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. That means you suffer long. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I couldn't say it better, so I just cut and pasted it. <laughs> because God has called us and made us in his image, we have this obligation and privilege to be like Christ in all these ways. And without Christ in our lives, we don't have the ability to do this. But because Christ is in our life, it's our privilege to shine for him. We can do this. God said, last section. God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be food. So to every beast of the earth, every bird of the air, and everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. 
And God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. There was evening and morning the sixth day. That's an overview of what God did in those six days. Chapter two, we're going to get into the seventh day. And then we're going to take a real close look in chapter two at God's creation of woman. And we're going to learn some things about God-ordained marriage. You know, it's the first institution he creates. Must be pretty important. So he says, here, I'm leaving all these plants and all these vegetables and fruits. This is food for you and for everything that walks on the planet. What's your first thought? Vegan. Vegan. (laughs) (laughs) Pastor Dave, where are you going with this? I think it's awesome that God provided food. He could have said, hey, every morning I want you to scrape the stuff that's sitting on top of the rock and you can bake it and you can eat that. No, he didn't say that. He said, I've got all these wonderful trees, everything's planted, just have at it. It's all food for you. And it's tasty. Fruit and vegetables. What about meat? Okay, I'll get there. (laughs) We get to the flood. You got 1,300 years to go until we get there. But God created, he could have said, here, take a pill. He could have said, scrape stuff off a rock. He could have said anything. But he creates things with such magical and wonderful flavors. I mean, in my old age, I'm learning to appreciate things like curry. I've always appreciated garlic and onions. And just before we're, we're done, I'm going to make you all hungry. <laughs> Citrus of all kinds, carrots cooked just right. I mean, it's all good. It's very good. God said it is. And he says, this is what you're going to eat. And the ground was quick with it and made all this happen. We don't get into meat eating until later. But we'll talk about that when we get there. I hope you guys are enjoying Genesis. I hope you're learning a couple of things. I had a whole different trajectory. I was going to go the whole scientific end with light shift and oh oh my goodness it would have killed you all (laughs) stay tuned come back next week there's better things to come amen (laughs) 